Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Hare Krishnas in Britain podcast, a podcast which virtually almost every week travels around the UK, chatting to devotees across Great Britain to find out what they're doing and to kind of, I guess, showcase in one sense the members of the Hare Krishna movement. And this week, um, it's not often that we go there. This week, we've gone to Folk Folkestone. I was going to say Folkestone. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. It's Folkestone. Folkestone. And our special guest this week is His Grace, Virabhadra Prabhu. Nice to see you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. And um, I actually met Vera a couple of years ago. He used to live in the West Country, which is where I'm from. And uh, he ended up uh, living quite near to where I'm living. And we've known each other for quite some time. Uh, and he obviously jumped at the chance to be on the podcast this week uh, to talk about... <laughs> to talk about some of the things he's involved with. So Vera, what's it like living in Folkestone? Because you actually, you know, you went from the, the West Country to Leicester of all places. Yeah, we've, we've moved around a fair bit, yeah. We've, uh, we've been finding a place to call home, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I'm, re I'm really loving Folkestone. You know, it's got everything you need. Um, we've got the sea on the doorstep. I've always been like a lover of the ocean. And um, yeah, we've got a nice little temple, storefront temple at the lounge on the high street so it's yeah it's nice and there's a lot of devotees in canterbury and different areas nearby so it's um yeah it's got a nice little community kind of good. Up. yeah i've seen the at the lounge mentioned on on facebook on social media and it, it looks uh it's like a shop that sells things and yeah they've got it's like you know the classic kind of uh kind of iskon storefront temple <laughs> like, it's actually got a shop on the ground floor and then a uh, temple room in the uh first floor and stuff so trying to yeah, nice draw people in yeah, yeah. Kind of i mean one, one thing i find interesting about Ferguson as well is that it's uh the whole kind of part of southeast um you know the east side of kent is uh you know it's the place where christianity began in england it's where the first church in christianity was established um and just down the road is the first nunnery in England and stuff wow. like that. So it's got this history of like religious beginnings and stuff, which I quite like. And there's definitely something in the uh, in the water or something here. It kind of feels a bit. So my kind of geography is terrible. How far away is Canterbury from Folkestone? So if you've got the, uh, yeah, I'm trying to do this in reflected mode. <laughs> you've got the very, if you've got the kind of the hump of England and then yeah. the little bit that sticks out. So that little bit is East Kent. And Canterbury is kind of on the top and then Folkestone's on the very bottom. So we're just next to Dover. OK, OK. Interesting. Uh, and yeah, I was just kind of thinking about the Archbishop of Canterbury and, you know, there's obviously some historical link with Christianity there and everything. So, yeah, very intriguing to know. And um, it's great to hear that because I've heard that there's a lot, quite a few devotees, Harry Krishna devotees now living in Kent. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, there's something called the Bhakti Project, I understand, which is about, I don't know, encouraging devotees to get on with each other. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, kind of looking after the land and various things. And um, yeah, that sounds really encouraging. Um, OK, so one of the kind of that links us on nicely, because one of the things we're going to talk about today is about agriculture. Uh, so you're you're um, super intelligent, you know, a lot about agriculture and you're doing a master's degree in agriculture so in theory you could talk about it for hours in theory yeah <laughs> so tell us a bit about what agriculture is and and why you're doing a master's degree in it um yes yeah, so I'm, I'm doing a master's in sustainable agriculture and food security um so you know agriculture is very much linked with food security um over the whole world there's so many countries that don't have food security um you know that people are suffering malnutrition or just plain starvation and that kind of thing um so sustainable agriculture is linked to this idea that in since kind of the 1930s but very much so since post world war ii there's been the green revolution which was basically when they started uh, i mean it, it was kind of characterized by the breeding of wheat. Uh, they used a dwarf variety of wheat, mixed it with a much taller, I think it was from Mexico or something, the dwarf variety. They mixed a very tall kind of spindly version of wheat with a dwarf that was like kind of very bushy. They mixed the two and that's basically where we've got a lot of modern wheat varieties from. 
ultimately it meant that you could from the one eight, same one acre you could go from your yield to being here to here kind of thing mm. and and since you know 1950 when this was really happening in a big way up until the present day there's a very good diagram actually on um i think you could just google like uh you know yields yield increases over decades mm. and it shows you a field which is like 1950 this is how much wheat you'd get from the land and like now the same amount of wheat you'd get from about this much it's an amazing like so and that's happened through the industrialization of agriculture um which you don't have to be a master's student or anything to really know that's had a huge amount of ramifications um and caused so many environmental problems and social problems so the sustainable agriculture side is understanding how we can maintain the levels and actually we need to do a lot to increase the levels of food security because there's going to be so many more threats in the next 30 years and currently we're not even meeting like food security across the world so how to meet food security but without damaging the environment and actually enhancing the environment enhancing social cohesion and that kind of thing mm. and, and ultimately making it economically viable so it's kind of this triangle of sustainability you've got economics environment and social that all need to be balanced yeah i was quite intrigued that you said that this this kind of didn't really start till the 1930s so what was happening before the 1930s with the the, the use of the land and mm. and crops and wheat and things well you had a lot more it was it was all local basically and um, we've moved away from that and everything is either produced very far away or kind of, you know, up at the other end of the country or something, and then it's centralized and then, you know, quality are checked and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, in the, you know, in the 1800s and stuff, there was a big, with the industrial revolution, there was a big drain on the rural population, which, mm -hmm. you know, depopulated farming areas and that kind of thing. So a lot of small farms did close in that era as well. Um, and, it's basically been a continuation of that but then with the 1930s with you know quicker travel between countries with kind of um you know oil and that kind of stuff coming in then importing the import market suddenly was there um and then you've got the birth of globalization essentially um and that's been the thing that's you know in in the uk we don't have small farms practically anymore you know the idea of a small farm you know something that's maybe two three acres Mm. where a family would live and grow most of their own food for the year but they would have a bit of surplus to sell barely exists and whilst that's not maybe the greatest kind of economic security it does provide you a uh, security with food um I'm just trying to get, I feel like I'm going off on a bit of a No, it's absolutely now. fine. You know, it's bizarre. It, I, things happen in your head. For some reason, I started thinking about The Waltons, which is that American Walton. TV show. Oh, I don't know if yeah, you saw yeah. it. Because I actually watched an episode the other day, and it was based in the 1930s. And they, as a family, were living off of the land, and they were growing mm -hmm. their own produce. And the storyline was around the kind of, the, was it the Great Depression? Yes. And, yeah. and it was very interesting. And then you go into the town, and actually, America in the 30s was... I mean, everything is relative, but it was quite modern mm. uh, and it kind of surprised me. I didn't think that certainly in America and I guess in Europe, so many things were happening in the 1930s. Mm. Uh, the 1930s were more advanced than I thought they were until I watched this episode of the Waltons. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a funny period between World War One and World War Two because it's kind of it's a lost couple of decades that not you don't learn about in school much, you know. You do hear about the Great Depression and stuff, but there was a lot of other crazy things happening, like the Great Dust Bowl of, um, I think it was in the 30s as well, where um, in kind of the mid states of America, mm. um, they, due to their way of agriculture, they're just been stripping the land and that kind of thing. And I can't remember all of the context that yeah. caused it, but there, there was literally just farms just being washed away by dust, literally just earth that was just getting wind eroded away. And covering like and so you had like a real problem and that's that's actually where the whole kind of the birth of regenerative and that kind of thing started to come about you know looking at these examples in history and being like okay how can we um how can we stop that 
Um, I don't know if you want me to get into regenerative agriculture now. I, I, I don't know. I mean, our audience is, is uh, I was going to say, very broad. That can mean a number of things. But uh, our audience kind of watching the podcast are uh, devotees, non-devotees, people that might be interested in agriculture, mm. people that might not be interested in agriculture. So we can talk about anything you want. I guess it's just kind of putting it into context as to, because yeah. at some point in, the, in our conversation today, I want to kind of link it back to kind of cow protection, vegetarianism, mm. using the land appropriately uh you know so well, yeah let me let yeah, me talk yeah. about regenerative then because personally i think it's a very um promising thing for society in general um re regenerative agriculture is basically the idea that you you don't till the land which i know is going to be a big like controversial point for a lot of kind of devotees around the idea of cow protection you know the, the, the bulls plow the land that's their job and that kind of thing but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there's these kind of basic tenets of regenerative, which is you don't plow the land, you don't disturb the soil structure repeatedly. Um, you keep it ground covered. So you, you always have some plants growing in the soil. You don't have these like big areas of just earth uncovered. Um, and you use livestock as well. So a big part of it is to graze livestock on the land. Even if you're growing wheat the next year or something, we'll have a year where you grow grass and you graze the livestock on it they trample down the weeds they eat the weeds and different things and um so yeah there is another tenant i've forgotten now off the top of my head but um but yeah so personally i feel like regenerative agriculture could be a really good thing for devotees as well to kind of look into more and i think covid has kind of spurred a lot of people in the devotee community to really question where we're at with kind of I mean, it's termed as establishing Varnashram. Um, personally, I feel that's a little bit problematic because I think there's a lot of steps before establishing Varnashram that we need to go through. Um, you know, that term of, you know, we need to, but the, the idea essentially is, yeah, we need to, we need to be somewhat independent, mm. um, which is a huge part of cow protection. Is it gives you that independence. Um, yeah, so I think... Um, yeah, so I'm getting a little bit lost. In no, it's absolutely it. fine. It's it's really interesting because um, we've kind of gone on to kind of Van Ashram to some extent, which we can talk about in a minute in terms of your, you know, your your um your own background and you know what you're doing now. But I think for me, it's I watched a film. Uh, we talked about this in our pre-chat before we started broadcasting today. We talked. Um, I told you about a film that I watched several years ago called um, Cow Spirit Cowspiracy. Uh, which is a really interesting one of those kind of in one sense it's a fringe film uh, that kind of didn't make the mainstream but it was some really hard-hitting facts about that the the kind of um, the meat and dairy industry all over the world uh, you know how much land is used uh, for uh, cows particularly to 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 live on I think it's about a half of was it a, so kind of meat and dairy the meat and dairy industry animal agriculture takes up about half of the planet's habitable space mm. which is a phenomenal amount well half and if you think that that's largely so the animals the cows uh, can be killed for human consumption mm. so obviously uh, there's other better uses for cows such as milk but ultimately this whole huge industry that the world is kind of bought into of, of of breeding cows, breeding cattle to, you know, eventually kill them for meat just for human beings sense gratification. It's what's causing a lot of the kind of global gas emissions. I mean, I looked up the stat this morning before we before we did this today, around 15 percent. So kind of, you know, methane gas uh, from from cows makes up around 15 percent of global um, greenhouse emissions. Mm gas emissions which is huge which is absolutely huge um obviously different websites say different stats based on different things but that's mm. a lot you know and you think that uh, 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 easy it sounds easy to us as vegetarians as devotees an easiest way to cut down on you know all these emissions we're releasing is to basically stop eating meat yeah yeah i agree with you like there's so many like layers to it as well that it might, you know, you've got you've got the area where the cow lives on. Then, you know, you'll see in America, especially these kind of 
massive cattle ranches, which are just lot, they're like concentration camps, basically. There's like lots of like bare earth filled with cows and there'll be like 200 in a big grid. Um, and it's, it's purely designed for economics. It's just, it's the most amount on the least space and it's all just stripped down industrialized agriculture. Um, so that's, that's one part of it is you've got the land that the cow's on. And then you've got the fact that they need to eat something still. So then the whole of kind of, you know, Iowa and uh, Nebraska and all these, you know, Midwest states are filled with corn and soya. And it's used to feed the livestock, which then gets killed. Um, you'll get some arguments that like, uh, you know, the, um, you know, we need to, we need to eat cows because if the, you know, if we are all vegetarians, this is quite a popular, I don't know if you've heard of Joe Rogan. He does, he's got like one of the biggest podcasts in the I've heard world, the name, basically. yeah, yeah. So he's, he's quite a carnivore and uh, he kind of puts this argument out there like that, um, you know, that the amount of stuff you kill with industrial um, uh, agriculture for the plants and stuff and wheat and legumes and all that kind of stuff is um, you'll kill so many insects and bugs and all these things. And it's just such a weak argument. Um, there's, there's many videos debunking that whole argument, which I'd kind of encourage you to watch if it's something that you're struggling with either in your own mm. mind or kind of with other people arguing against you and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so really it can be, if we, if we weren't eating meat, the amount of land that you'd need to feed the human population isn't going to be anywhere near as much. Um, and also the other thing is the whole kind of methane emissions. The cows, are, the cows that are being bred for livestock, uh, especially in kind of, you know, the States and these very intensive systems, um, are, they're going to be eating very dense kind of concentrated foods. And I don't know if, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have had experience of kind of, you know, if you've had a protein shake or just something, something that's very concentrated, it usually doesn't get digested very well. Um, and it's the same for the cows as well. It's not their natural diet a lot of the time. Yes, they do make kind of silage, which is fermented. Um, they'll take the corn and the soybeans and that kind of thing, and they'll ferment it to make it more digestible. But even still, it's, the, it's just not a very natural way for the cow to eat. And because of that, I, I do need to do a bit of research into it and find some more kind of authority to back this up, this kind of claim up. But I think that's a big part of the reason why there's probably more methane emissions from cows. Whereas if they were having a kind of more natural lifestyle, it wouldn't be as bad. Mm. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And, and certainly uh, in, in, uh, in our spirit tradition, in the Krishna conscious tradition, giving up, not eating meat is one of the principal activities, one of the main activities. And it was certainly when I, tried to start following Krishna consciousness and try and be a devotee giving up meat was the first thing that I did before the other things actually because it was such it was the obvious thing to yeah, give yeah. up in terms of you know recognizing that every that every everything that's uh, a lot animals and plants as well as human beings uh, are, are, are you know spiritual sparks inside of spiritual sparks you know all living entities are conscious and everything and you know this whole kind of uh, hierarchical structure that maybe other religious traditions might adhere to like in, in Christianity they justify the eating of meat because you know meat's provided by God and therefore you know uh, I can't remember the verse now but there's a verse in a hymn and in the Old Testament which is about kind of God provides things for us all good things mm. that God provides but I mean you know we would take a completely yeah. different view well I, I think I think the Vedic perspective is really interesting because even in you know in the Mahabharata and Ramayana and Shrima Bhagavatam, you hear of meat eating, like among Kshatriyas mm. and that kind of thing. And well, they wouldn't necessarily eat the meat, but they would hunt it. And then maybe like some, you know, some of the other groups of people would eat it and stuff. It does exist and it's, it's always going to be there. I think that, I can't remember which purple, but I know there's a purple where Prabhupada talks about meat eating and he's like, it will always be there. And he talks about the whole kind of the process of taking a goat up on the hill on a moon and you know you say a mantra to the goat and this kind of thing like the vedas have a process if you're going to eat meat and you know christianity is you know many other religions will encourage meat eating um but i think all religious people 
and even non-religious people can disagree with the industrialized agriculture, which is the real cause for the disruption of the planet in a lot of mm. ways. Um, it's a very obvious thing. You don't need to really even argue it. It's just like, come on, like you're a human being, you have some basic logic, like it's clearly not a good decision. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Mm. <laughs> I, I guess, it's really inspiring and really encouraging for for anyone listening who wants to maybe start living a more sustainable lifestyle. What kind of a, what kind of basic tips or advice would you would you give them? Uh, it's a tricky one. Like I'm guilty of doing the wrong things a lot of the time. Like um, you know, I mean, like there's a big thing of obviously cutting down plastics and that kind of thing. Um, I think yeah, if, if you're not a, already a vegetarian, I think that would be the first. Obvious Absolutely, step. yeah. I mean, we've already covered that. Um, I mean, yeah, and like, and then if you are already a vegetarian, it's then looking at what you're eating and kind of, you know, where it's coming from. Is that can you adjust your diet to make it more local? That kind of thing. I can is I like, for example, in Folkestone, and actually across the country, there's a, something called the um, CSA Network, um, mm. Community Supported Agriculture Network. Um, sorry, I'm getting confused. The Open Food Network. Um, it's the Open Food Network and part of like one of the, they all have their independent sub branches. There's one in Folkestone and it's all local food. Um, that's a really easy way to be more sustainable. You know, it might not be organic a lot of the time and that kind of thing. But if you start investing in your local community and buying like your vegetarian food from there, that's a massive step for actually improving the rural economy. So when the rural economy starts building up again, then it will be cheaper to buy organic. It will be easier to produce organic. It will, and all these other things will start happening. But if we keep buying, you know, if you're if you're getting your kind of things flown in from halfway around the world and you're mm. not really consciously consuming, you're, I don't want to say equally guilty as like a <laughs> meat eater who's just eating whatever that you know. But it, you, you've got some level of guilt still as well. I mean, obviously, there's the whole thing of offering. To Krishna and that kind of thing which relieves us of some of that but if we know we can do better then there's uh then there's definitely steps we can take but conversely on the other side of that you know the way I struggle with it is just affording it a lot of the time um so it is a real kind of balancing act is like what can you what can you sustain economically what mm. can you actually do sustainably for yourself are you, is it going to ruin your finances to eat better, more local, organic, or whatever? The the problem, I mean, the the, the the thing that I've identified is you go to the kind of these local alternative food shops, green living, sustainable shops, and it the the products are more expensive, not all the time, but generally more expensive than the mainstream supermarkets like Sainsbury's and Tesco. So if you're a family on a low income, or you're just somebody who wants to not spend so much money all the time, you'll go to the bigger food supermarkets. And they're, they're starting to do things differently now, which is good in terms of different food options. I mean, veganism is so much more popular than it was, uh, uh, you know, than 10, 20 years ago. But ultimately, it, it is about cost. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, you know, if you want to buy local fruit actually even though they haven't traveled very far they're more expensive than the fruit in asda it's all, it's all the economy of scale and that yeah you know, if you've got a farm in spain that can produce ridiculous amounts of oranges it's going to be so much cheaper i mean spain's not a bad example anyway it's quite close but it's going to be so much cheaper to get those oranges than somewhere nearby or you know but yeah so it's the economy of scale as well and that's why you know these supermarket Far, like these farms linked to supermarkets mm, yeah. are producing on a scale that's just yeah it's kind of unimaginable really like and that's so much easier to kind of fit within the whole industrial system and uh, keep the cost down and everything but yeah yeah it's a tricky one and like one thing I've realized from doing all this studying is that you can make some choices and if you've got the money you can do a fair bit more but really there has to be it's a top down you know there has to be some changes at the top really for things to become more sustainable and i think the, the yeah the only real big choice that you can do to make an impact is give up meat um if you can buy organic it's great as well um but yeah just that one thing alone and that's something that you can actually save money on in reality um so yeah that's that really is the one kind of big one key I think, thing that everyone can do and yeah. actually it's easy 
yeah. mean, it, it, it's an adjustment. It's, it's an, an adjustment. adjustment. But once you've done that adjustment and learned how to cook different recipes and that kind of thing, learn how to substitute it. Like we had pasta earlier. One thing I do a lot is, you know, just mash up beans. So we had butter beans or you can use chickpeas. Chickpeas I find are good because they've got a bit more texture to them. But you boil them and just mash them up with tomato sauce. And it's, it's like, it's actually better than soy mince as well. Because um, then, you know, there's the whole soy problems of, you know, people argue about that. But I can't really get into that. But. <laughs> I, I remember when I when I became a vegetarian, uh, it must have been about 10 years ago now, and my I have, I have friends and family that are not devotees. I still have a lot of friends and family that are not devotees. Uh, one of the first things they said to me is, oh, what are you going to eat now? Uh, you've nothing left to eat. Uh, you know, like, are you going to eat rabbit food? <laughs> yeah. uh, and actually, no, I, I mean, sometimes I eat rabbit food. But no, I mean, there's so many wonderful things, you know, rice and, and potatoes and fruit and vegetables and, uh, you know, um, delicious, tasty uh, ice cream. I mean, you know, we're giving up meat, fish and eggs. And uh, but there's so many other things that are not meat, fish and eggs. Uh, mm. You know, I know a lot of the people watching this broadcast will will also be vegan and choose not to have anything from an animal. But there's still lots of plant based food products that are healthy, that are that are good for you. You know, and I've really been impressed by, I guess, the growth of veganism. Uh, you know, kind of the Hare Krishna movement isn't promoting veganism, even though I think some of the gurus now have taken that conscious decision to be vegans, yeah. unless the milk is from a protected cow. Yeah. yeah. And that unfortunately, there's very few protected cows in the world. You know, if you're living at a temple that, that has a goshal or a cow sanctuary and they produce milk like Bhaktivedanta Manor, or mm. I think, I think she Ramswami's, uh, ashram in Hungary, but there's very few of those. So a lot of the gurus, when they're not near a, a goshala or a, or a temple, will choose to, um, you know, be vegan uh, because they, they, you know, it's kind of a statement, I think, against the cruel animal industry and the way that, that milk is extracted from um, a cow. Um, but so veganism is massively popular. And uh, certainly when I've been at Glastonbury distributing prashadam at the Hari, with the Hare Krishna uh, festival program, we've been distributing prashadam. Uh, a lot of young, so Glastonbury is a festival with lots of young people or older people go to. But I'd say at least one in six people uh, queuing up for prashadam will say, is it vegan? One in six as a lot, because they're conscious about what they're eating. They're conscious about where their food comes from. And, um, and one evening we had some some prashadam that that uh, wasn't vegan sometimes we do well it wasn't vegan but it had some milk product and even i explained about prashadam and what it was and you know we love cows they still weren't having any of it <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, i can't remember. yeah it's a tricky one like i mean what we do now here like in my house is um we we've found a dairy a local dairy and we've uh, with the help of one devoted friend, Tru and Krishna, we've talked with them and we've got them to agree to keep a group of cows separate from the herd that will never go to slaughter. And um, they're, yeah, they're very nice people that run the farm. So they've been doing that and I, we buy all our milk from there. And it's not, it's one pound per pint. So it's not, it doesn't work out hugely more expensive either. Um, and we've got a very modest income. We're managing that. So that's that's something that because, you know, I don't I don't. I'm not going to become a vegan. I've already made that. I've already made that decision up, you know, like and I know I know there's so many arguments for and against and everything Actually, I don't want to even bother getting into. Um, for me personally, it's that, you know, I've got two kids and I want them to kind of have the same nutrition. And, stuff. and again, I know people can argue that you can get that nutrition without um it's my opinion that i yeah i want to you're allowed to have your own opinion it's fine yeah exactly um, I guess it's just because so we've joined the harry christian movement doesn't mean we, uh <laughs> abandoned our own free will uh, yeah well, then, it's more just the, the day and age we live in it's just that uh, you get attacked online for just expressing yeah. your opinion but um but yeah so my personal thing is to take responsibility of where i get my milk like i've seen how those cows are being looked after i've seen the cows that i'm getting my milk directly from mm. I know how they're being looked at. I know the people that are running the farm and I think they're good people. They're not, they've got the best interest of the animals at heart. Um, so I trust that my milk's coming from a good source. It's not from one of these really horrible, again, industrial kind of style um, dairy farms. Um, 
yeah so it's it, again it goes back to this kind of local idea which is for me something that's becoming more and more prominent um of actually yeah trying to see what's close to you what's around you what can you get as much as possible i was invited uh to a school recently in wiltshire which is kind of south central england to give a talk about to uh, a-level students about krishna consciousness and godia vaishnavism uh, uh and one of the questions i talked about cows and how you know cows are kind of the, the the cow is the mother of india uh you know every family has a cow and the milk and it's special and krishna was a cowherd boy and all of that i was talking about that uh, and they the question that their first question was or oh, do you have do you have your own cow do you keep a cow at home and i explained that i didn't um but it's a nice kind of idealistic i said if i if i was in a family in india uh or even not in a family in india i might have my own cow but mm. in the uk in our western kind of culture it's very difficult for every house to have a cow um mm. but there are people that are moving to that lifestyle um so talking about lifestyles we've talked a bit about cow protection today vegetarianism veganism agriculture um way before i ever met you uh, and uh, uh, you were a brahmachari uh, a long yeah. time ago Kind of previous life it must feel like now uh <laughs> the title of today's talk is cow protection cow protection kids and krishna so we're going to talk about the second bit now so you were a you were a brahmachari at soho street which is uh, the radha krishna yes. temple uh about 10 years ago i believe 10 12 years ago yeah yeah 10 years ago yeah so tell us yeah, tell us a bit <laughs> about what what a brahmachari is uh what it's about and you know um a bit about your background and kind of where you're from i guess um yeah so yeah i mean a brahmachari is is a monk essentially um it's someone who's you know in in kind of the sanskrit language the the word brahman it means the it can be a synonymous word for god basically um a brahmachari is one who's trying to know brahman and um, so it's a life of celibacy it's a life of being a monk and it's a life dedicated to trying to reach a kind of a higher plane of consciousness um, of god consciousness christian consciousness um so yeah I, I was 17 when i became a brahmachari i was um i was at school and um, i remember i was in a re lesson one day a religious education lesson one day and the teacher was asking some question about like what's the great like talking about evil or what's the greatest something like that and then i was like trying to be smart and funny and all that and i was like religion is the greatest evil and um i was very atheistic in my upbringing um you know it was kind of part of my family culture was atheism and you know the idea of a god or anything like that was very it was almost ridiculous to consider um so i said this in the class and the teacher kind of didn't like it i knew he was from a christian background that's why i said it and uh yeah, he, he, we got into a little kind of heated debate in the classroom. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, then like then a bit of time went by and stuff. And then I was thinking one day about religion and I was like, still in this very kind of threatened position by religion. And I was like, well, it has so much power, like, you know, probably about three quarters of the world follow some sort of religion um, or more, really. And um, I was like, OK, I should really know about I've always been fascinated by power structures and what how power is amassed and how it kind of how it is used and that kind of thing. So I wanted to get to know the religions of the world. So I just started reading um, all these different books. I uh, started reading about Sikhism to begin with. And then I was starting to look at Abrahamic religions, um, you know, started reading the Quran a bit and the Bible and a little bit about Judaism. And then I started finding out about Buddhism and yoga. And um, I really got attracted to kind of more Eastern philosophies. Mm especially Buddhism for a long time. I was really interested in that. And, um, and yeah, just was reading loads and loads and loads. And I, um, I'd actually come across the Bhagavad Gita and all this reading and I'd read that and it was a, it was a translation. I forget the translation of it. I think it was a penguin version, penguin publishers. Um, and I read a bit of that and I thought it was kind of cool and uh, sounded interesting. It was sounded a bit trippy to me and my kind of, dazed youth <laughs> and um and then i ordered two books offline um from amazon and as you know sorry before that I, I used to spend a lot of time on youtube and um just watching videos about sadhus and monks and all these things and i was like saw in the sidebar one day this image of Prabhupada, and it was immediately kind of just 
like, oh, what's that? And then I saw underneath it, it said um, Bhakti Yoga. And I'd been reading loads about all different types of yoga and never heard of Bhakti Yoga. And I was like, oh, what's that? So clicked on it and it was Prabhupada chanting Jaya Radha Madhava. And uh, I felt this like, whoa, what is this? This is something real. Like there's something here. And like, but then immediately just forgot about it after that. Didn't really think much more until a couple of months later. And then I was like, ah, oh, let me, let me find out a bit more about Krishna. And uh, I didn't remember the Bhakti Yoga. That I'd forgotten about that video completely, basically. And bought these two books off Amazon. And uh, I'd made sure specifically not to buy another Bhagavad Gita as well, because I was like, well, I've read that. I want to read something else about Krishna. So I bought this one. It was like a sort of translation of the 10th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, and another book, which I can't remember the name of. Um, so the one about, you know, the 10th canto, the translation that came, and then the other book came and I opened it and I was like, I didn't order this. And I pulled it out and it was Bhagavad Gita as it is. And I was like, what? I didn't, this is not the book I ordered. And I flipped over and I saw Prabhupada's picture and I was like, I just felt this like, what are you doing? Kind of feeling like, what are you doing here? <laughs> it felt like someone had like come into my room. And um, it was a very uh, funny mystical experience. And I was just like, I went upstairs, got my computer, checked the order. And I was like, they've, they've, yeah, they've sent me the wrong book. So immediately from my first kind of interaction with Prabhupada's books, it was like a very like, hmm, there's, there's something mystical here. At that time, I was very enamored by the whole kind of Mayavad concept, the idea that you can become one with God and actually your consciousness is just like a fragmented part of the original kind of supreme entity. And through meditation and reaching enlightenment, you kind of merge back into that oneness. So you become God again. And... Uh, through studying that and trying to practice that a bit I'd kind of come to this conclusion that it wasn't satisfying like I remember like having this kind of realization one day that everything is you and I was walking my dog and saying hello to people walking past and stuff as you do and just thinking actually there's nothing there's no there's no relationship there it's just you it's just another part of your consciousness like well like and then I started like expanding that and thinking well actually there's no there's no relationships at all like you've got zero relationships with anyone anywhere at any time and you can never have a rela real relationship again because it's like and it freaked me out and I was like no that can't be the truth because it's so unsatisfying not to have any relationships in life not to have any of that kind of that love that you share with another person um then I opened this Bhagavad Gita and the first thing I read was Prabhupada saying the living entity can never become one with God because the, the living entity is under illusion. How can God come under illusion? Mm. And just in that sentence, it just smashed all these ideas in a really positive way. And uh, yeah, from that moment, I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to dedicate myself to. And then, you know, a bit of time went by. And, and you were just 17 at the time. All this happened when you yeah, were 17. Yeah. That's quite amazing yeah, yeah. for a 17-year-old to... Yeah, I mean, Prophet's books are amazing as well, you know, like... But yeah, it was it was a funny funny period. Um, because obviously yeah, so, you're, you're, you're you're kind of atheistic upbringing. Your your family are not were not are not Harry Krishna devotees. So all of a sudden you go from this atheistic family and you don't you don't get involved with one of the Abrahamic faiths like Christianity or something because but you go to kind of this kind of Harry Krishna type Eastern thing that they they uh, and what's their whole when you kind of become a brahmachari at seventeen you were yeah. seventeen when you become a brahmachari right uh yeah basically i was 18 actually yeah, 18 was like, yeah. what was your kind of parents perception or, or response yeah to i that? think my, the, my mom's first reaction when i told her i was going to become a harry christian was oh no not the harry krishnas <laughs> <laughs> yeah she had like grown up in the 70s and 80s and stuff and kind of experienced quite a kind of a cultish kind of following um so yeah she was a bit negative at first but yeah she visited the temple and i introduced her to different friends and stuff there and and then she kind of came around to the idea and um, they always found it weird that I was a monk. And I think in our kind of culture today, it's a very odd concept yeah. to be a monk and like, it's a very odd lifestyle and everything, you know? So, and I think at that time as well, I was very fanatical and um, <laughs> very kind of, I think in my kind of immature way of kind of feeling like I need to get really focused on it to be able to kind of, jump up a bit and reach the standards I had I kind of at that time I felt like I needed to kind of push everything away of my past and my past life and everything um 
so that pushed them away quite a lot as well and it kind of did cause a bit of tension um but yeah over time then they kind of mellowed out once i kind of left and got married then they were really much more happy i think because then mm. it was like okay like they can they can see me again they can visit more they can hang out a bit more i'm not so kind of militant with my time which i think a lot of the time a brahmachari kind of can be and kind of sort of has to be as well um but yeah mm. Yeah, I mean, I was never a fanatical Harry Krishna, uh, but I was a fanatical Christian for a very short period of time in probably my early 20s, maybe. Yeah, maybe I think it's that. That, that age you kind of, you can be. <laughs> yeah, and you feel like you found the truth. You know, I've yeah. discovered the truth and this is absolutely the truth and everyone else needs to know the truth and everyone else is wrong. Uh, yeah, and you're kind of baffled that no one else can just immediately yeah. understand the truth yeah. that you've discovered. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so how long were you a brahmachari for at Soho Street? Not, not so long. Well, I was I was a brahmachari in Cape Town for two years. Wow. And Soho Street for another year and a half. So it was about, but then... It was probably like two and a half, two and a bit years. It was basically added up to about four years. Um, so it wasn't long in comparison to a lot of people. Um, but yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was an interesting experience. Like, you know, I don't, I don't regret it at all doing it. Like, you know, from 17 to 22, basically, or 21, 22, I was a uh, brahmachari. So that's kind of, you know, your peak mm. kind of years of debauchery usually. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't regret really missing out on that. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, at times I've maybe regretted the kind of the end of it. Like, I really wanted to travel more and that kind of thing. And I think at times I've regretted not experiencing that because I went straight from an ashram, very kind of rigid lifestyle. That's kind of, you know, you've got to answer to your hierarchy of kind of temple leaders and that kind of thing. Um, I went from that to being married and being responsible for house, you know, all these things like in within months, actually. Um, so there's no so kind of transition because a lot of no. I, I, I make it I mean I've never been a brahmachari certainly not in this life but I make the assumption that someone's a brahmachari they then might express an interest to leave that ashram uh, uh, and, and be single for a while be a, yeah. a, a single independent person before looking for a partner looking for a wise wife uh, you know and getting married but it sounds like for you it happened quite quickly in kind of a short yeah. period of time yeah, um, I think like I, you know, I met my wife and quite quickly kind of fell in love with her. And, you know, so that, that <laughs> that's was so quite sweet. A, <laughs> so that was quite a um, quite a difficult. Like, you know, I did think I maybe should go a bit slower, but then you know, it was just kind of. I think I was also I'm quite a passionate person anyway. So I, I once I'm like living in the mode of passion, living in the sort mode of, of yeah, it was yeah the same way that I got into Krishna consciousness, which was like very quick. It was like you know within a year I was already initiated and you know living in the ashram and um which for a lot of people is like whoa that's super quick to be like mm -hmm. gone from like you know taking drugs eating meat and everything and then a year later I mean maybe not in the 70s but nowadays it's a bit less kind of common um but yeah so yeah I kind of I would probably recommend most brahmacharis that were changing ashrams to go a bit slower maybe I think you can kind of yeah make yeah, I mean, but it's, it depends on who you are, really, and kind of the context you're in and everything. Yeah, I mean, you you touched briefly on kind of our ashram system earlier on in our conversation, uh, uh, and, and and it can be. This is a personal opinion now. It can be. It can be. Not always. It can be quite difficult to apply that Vaan ashram system to Western culture in terms mm -hmm. of living in a in an ashram, which means a. a in a particular way, you know, either Brahmachari or Griasta or then moving up to Vanaprast or even Sanyas, uh, you know, or, it's very difficult to apply that to, my opinion and experience, to Western culture. Some people have other views, that's fine, uh, you know, and uh, certainly a number of people in ISKCON uh, will call it uh, the fifth ashram is this idea of you're not a Brahmachari, you're not a Griasta, you're kind of somewhere in the middle or you're somewhere somehow detached from a temple living a single life uh yes. i think one guru joked and called it the uh brihasta uh which I'll is kind of a made up which is a made up word <laughs> it's not really a, a brihasta yeah a brihasta which is kind of halfway in between and some devotees will stay brihastas forever <laughs> uh you know and um yeah um it's 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 interesting it's very interesting um okay um so you're doing this uh, this master's degree now in agriculture is that a year's 
uh, kind of course? Is that yeah, just so I'm, I'm finishing in September. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know what, what next. We'll see. And then you're planning to kind of maybe work in agriculture after that? Uh, yeah, I'm not 100% sure kind of what I want to, you know, I like kind of big, uh, big things in terms of like <laughs> big reach and impact kind of thing. You want to make a difference. You want to change yeah, the world. Yeah, I want to make a difference. So like, you know, one route could be to work within some sort of government, um, you know, uh, institution or something a, a government body department or an NGO yeah, as, especially at the moment this is quite an interesting time as well because um because we've just had brexit um we've left something called the common agricultural policy so that was the common agricultural policy basically gave subsidies and all these things to farmers but now that's all changing and farmers will get given money for public goods uh public goods being like clean waterways uh, you know the reinvigoration of wildlife uh, for opening up more pathways on their land these kind of things so people like things that are good for the public basically um, so yeah there's going to be a lot of work to be done in that so that's something I may get into and it is something I'm also I feel like in the future there'll be an opportunity to get some land for devotees through some sort yeah it's, it's just a feeling I have and usually my feelings are pretty We all have feelings. Accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. on the farming issue, yeah, it sounds like kind of looking after and looking after farmers and caring for farmers is kind of a, a new arm of the state. You know, mm. the state does certain roles, performs certain roles in society. And another one now, um, congratulations, by the way, that you're the first person on this podcast to mention Brexit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got to episode 12 without anyone mentioning it. I mean, it's not really been talked about recently, but there's been another issue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but um, yeah, so obviously uh, my limited knowledge of kind of agriculture and, and the kind of farming industry is, yeah, you know, one of the things that happened when we were in the European Union is that the EU would provide support to farmers. Um, uh, and that's obviously not happened now. So the government's stepping in, which is actually really, really good um, mm. and providing that support. Um, yeah. Um, and I also mentioned something else, but it kind of went off on a tangent then farming. Uh, well, I, was, I was just going to add on to that, though, that in terms of kind of, you know, how and I think it links back to the thing you were saying about the kind of the Brahasta and that kind of thing is, especially in kind of, you know, the West and, you know, the UK and that kind of thing. Um, I think all of us, not all of us, but a lot of us struggle to follow the kind of rigid rules of an institution. And, uh, you know, the Varnashram can very much be that way, especially if it's something you're trying to kind of, uh, kind of bring out, you know, bring onto a, like mm. a small society yeah. or something yeah um for me my kind of idea to kind of i'm involved with the Bakti project you mentioned earlier which we're um, there's yeah just a few of us and we're trying to we're trying to basically start some sort of farm community in the uk uh, it's very early days and we've all got slightly differing visions of what it will take shape as um my personal idea for and i think it's becoming a bit more kind of uh, universal as well is instead of having everyone live in a kind of sort of commune setting trying to establish like who's the brahmins who's the kshatriya who's the you know and be very kind of black and white about it mm. to recognize our own very nuanced kind of mixed up upbringings we're not very stuck in one category and that kind of thing of you know we're not just purely brahminical and all these kind of things um recognizing that in ourselves and then applying that to our society um for me that would take the shape of a, like something like a plot of land with a temple where we grow where community grows food and it's yeah sort of like allotments you can have your own bit of land that you do your own thing on but then there's like other bits that are more community based that maybe the temple runs off and that kind of thing uh depending on how big a piece of land you can get as well because then you can mm, do more with mm. it um and not worry too much about necessarily the kind of commune side of it where people are actually living there straight away. Um, it, yeah, just the idea of kind of starting a community around mm. some land is there's a lot of things you need to get right. Um, I think first and foremost, there needs to be really strong relationships with the group of people you're working with. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that's kind of yeah, going off a little bit on a tangent. Yeah, yeah. and it's very interesting. And, and one community that springs to mind 
it's not completely uh, the same as what you're describing, but it's Karuna Bhavan, which is the Hare mm. Krishna farm community in Scotland, which is kind of similar uh, to some extent that there is a, a temple, there is a Hare Krishna temple kind of farm community. And then some people live in the ashram part, uh, but then other devotees will live in houses outside in mm. the town. And that's that kind of collectivism. There's that kind of joined up approach, but some people are joined up in different ways based on their own yeah. interests and needs. And some yeah, want to I be, think, yeah, that's yeah. always going to probably be the case as well. Like, I don't think, you know, like a, in Hungary, the new Braj Dam kind of um, model, I think that's going to be very hard to establish in a place like the United Kingdom where it's, you've got, yeah, Peter, like I said, people don't like to <laughs> be told what to do and stuff, you know. So. I hate being told what to do. <laughs> 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 Um, okay, um, Veer Bhatra Prabhu, it's been fantastic having you as the, the guest on this week's edition of the Harry Christians of Britain, a podcast where we're traveling virtually because we can't do it for real at the moment. Well, we can kind of start doing stuff for real now. Uh, traveling around the UK to chat to devotees with what they're doing and meet some of the wonderful people um, in the Harry Christian movement. So in a minute, we're going to say I'm going to say goodbye to our uh, viewers at home, but I'll still chat to Vera Badra after and we can uh, chat about some of the uh, other exciting projects uh, he's involved with. Um, so if you're watching this on Facebook, please do like, please do put a positive comment and please do share it with your friends and family. And also you can watch it uh, on uh, my YouTube channel where you can comment as well and you can subscribe uh, and listen to other editions future editions of the harry christians in britain podcast so thank you all for joining uh, tuning in and joining us and we'll see you next week thank you thank you bro. harry krishna